Hello! I recently came across a video by Noel Plum with an interesting argument. I haven't heard of him before, but the argument's cool, so I thought I'd make a response to it. So, without further ado, here's the argument. So, let's start off with a god. And I'm going to propose a god to you, and I'm going to call that god, God B. God B is all-knowing and all-powerful, omniscient and omnipotent, easily powerful enough to create a universe such as our own. So let's draw that universe in and we could represent that universe. Let's represent that universe just for the lulls uh, with the earth, okay? To represent the kind of gross anthropocentrism that religions have, have, have demonstrated over the years and parochial kind of viewpoint. Let's see if I can draw it to a sort of scale map of, of, the, uh, of the planet. There's there's Great Britain and, and uh, Ireland and there's sort of North America, South America, Australia's down here somewhere, Antarctica's there, there's Asia and the rest of Europe and Africa there. Perfect. Okay. Absolutely spot on. Okay. God B is more than capable of doing that, but doesn't. Instead, what God B does is God B sinks its energies into creating another hyper-intelligent, hyper-powerful agent God A and does three very specific things when it creates God A. It creates God A such that God A has a belief uh, in its own omniscient status, such that God A has a belief in its own omnipotence, but also creates God A such that God A has no knowledge either of God B's existence, nor that it was created by God B, so that it erroneously believes that it is the ultimate being, the first cause. God A is the agent that then goes on to create our universe. Okay, I am sure by now you can already see the epistemic dilemma that that place is God A, or indeed any instances of a God A. The problem for God A's is that it's impossible for a God A to differentiate between being genuinely omniscient, being genu genuinely om omnipotent, and being genuinely the first causal agent, or erroneously labouring under those beliefs as a result of being created that way by a God B. But here's the real kicker. I said at the beginning that God B was omnipotent and omniscient, but equally it's impossible to make those claims because a God B cannot differentiate between being genuinely omnipotent and genuinely omniscient, uh, genuine, genuinely omnipotent and omniscient, or being erroneously created that way by a God C, who again hasn't revealed themselves to God B. God C is in the same epistemic dilemma doesn't know whether it genuinely holds those characteristics relative to a god D. Now, this argument was presented in a very intuitive way, rather than a premise-conclusion format. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm going to try and convert it into that format so that I could lay out what I understand to be the argument structure and clearly present where I think the argument goes awry. So, here we go. Premise 1. For any agent A with a subjective experience of reality E, if there is a possible story S, wherein A has E and believes P but P is false, then A does not actually know P. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to actually stop and illustrate this premise with an example. Imagine Jim claims to have seen Bigfoot. This is a story he believes it to be true because he saw Bigfoot with his own eyes. Now we can imagine a more skeptical individual coming up with a second story. Jim ran into someone who was dressed like Bigfoot rather than a real Bigfoot. What's important about these two stories is that in both of them, Jim has the exact same visual and all other experiences. If Jim actually lived through one story and the other, they would both look and feel the exact same to him. And the second story is totally possible. So what premise one says is that Jim can't really know that his story is true rather than the other. There is no way to differentiate between them. Maybe Jim is in reality correct, but he can't know that until he rules out the other story. Moving on, premise two is, there is a possible story where God has the same subjective experience of reality that he has in the actual world, but in this story, God believes some P such that P is false. This is the story that was presented by Noel Plum. Conclusion three, therefore there is some P which God does not know.
Premise four, if there is some P which God does not know, then God is not omniscient. Conclusion five, therefore God is not omniscient. I think four is pretty uncontroversial, so to dispute the argument's conclusion, I either need to reject premises one or two or both. Coolio. Now before getting into which premise I want to reject, I'm going to make a couple notes about the argument. First, this argument doesn't show that omniscience is logically incoherent, since not all premises are logically necessary. Second, notice that in both of those premises, I've included the word possible. This is actually necessary for the argument. If, for example, we gave Jim a logically impossible story where he's deceived about Bigfoot, he shouldn't care. The story has to be possible for him to care, because if he's only deceived in impossible stories, that's the same as saying that it's impossible for him to be deceived. But this leaves us with a question. What kind of possibility are we talking about here? In what way does a story need to be possible before it starts causing us to doubt our knowledge? Two interpretation candidates are metaphysical possibility and logical possibility. Hopefully you know what those are because I'm not explaining that here. Now if we want to interpret the argument to be referring to metaphysical possibility, then premise two is blatantly false for it is metaphysically necessary that God is omniscient and uncreated. Any story that includes the contrary, including Noel Plum's, is metaphysically impossible. So for the argument to get off the ground, we're going to need to go with logical possibility. And if we interpret possibility this way, premise two is actually quite plausible. To demonstrate it, you just need to give a not contradictory story, whether or not it's metaphysically possible, of a mistaken being having the same subjective experience as the actual world god, like Noel Plum did. And unless you define God's inner thought life in a really weird way, then that should be doable. Side note, classical theism, a certain branch in theology, does define God's inner thought life in a really weird way. My understanding is that they want to say that God's internal properties are unchanging throughout time and throughout different possible worlds. So if something does change across possible worlds, like the contents of God's knowledge, then that has to be external to God himself. And I'm no expert, but my understanding is that this means very roughly that the things that exist in the world simply are the contents of God's knowledge in some way. Again, I'm no expert, but as far as I could tell, classical theists can always deny premise two since the things that exist in any hypothetical story automatically constitute the contents of God's knowledge in that story. So it's not logically possible for the classical theist God to be mistaken. But I'm not a classical theist, and I actually find it quite weird, so I wouldn't push this objection. Instead, I'm going to attack premise one. Just think about how this principle applies to our knowledge of everyday common sense facts, like, I have hands. Now, here's the story. I'm actually a brain in a vat, and the entire external world is a simulation. This is both a logically and metaphysically possible story, wherein my subjective experience of reality is the same as it is in the actual world. So, premise one of the argument entails that I don't know that I have hands, nor do I know anything else at all about the external world. However, I do know plenty of things about the external world. I mean, I'm no genius, but I know that I have hands. So that premise of the argument is false. This might sound like cheating, but it's not. This is what's called a Morian shift. Basically, no matter what arguments you could give me in support of premise one, the premises of those arguments will never be as obvious as the fact that I know at least something about the external world. So I think that premise one is basically as shaky as a premise can get when it comes to philosophical arguments. It's pitted against literally all the empirical knowledge any human has ever had. Ever. That's bad. But setting that aside, if you actually convince me that God couldn't be omniscient only by annihilating the possibility of all knowledge whatsoever, my conclusion wouldn't be that there's some problem with theism. Rather, i just conclude that the truly important thing is simply having true beliefs, and this unattainable knowledge stuff isn't significant at all. And nothing in this argument says God can't have all true beliefs. However, we can of course tweak the argument's first premise to try and steel man this argument. Maybe instead of saying, the possibility of a subjectively identical story eliminates the possibility of knowledge, it rather eliminates the possibility of certainty, by which I mean having a credence of one. The logical possibility of these subjectively identical stories means our credences need to be below one. 
Credence is another philosophy term I'm not defining in this video. Anyways, this form of the argument actually touches on some work by Liz Jackson and Justin Mooney on the question of whether or not God even has credences. If he doesn't, then God just has beliefs, which we've already established can constitute knowledge. So God can be omniscient, while nonetheless never possessing a credence of one. However, if you want to say God has credences, I think he would still make all his credences one, because what else should he make them? It's not like he can go off the probability that Noel Plum's story is true, since the nature of probability is defined by metaphysical necessity, whereas the possibility of Noel Plum's story is in the realm of logical possibility, upstream from metaphysical possibility. To put it another way, the scenarios we're considering aren't even in the domain of what probability discusses. This makes it unclear why God would have any reason to assign a credence between 0 and 1 to the propositions he omnisciently knows. And the fact that his omniscience is infallibly reporting the truth of propositions to him makes it seem like he definitely shouldn't assign a credence of 0 to them, so the only option he has is to assign a credence of 1 to the propositions he knows. So at the end of this, I don't have too many qualms about the other premises of this argument, but I don't think that this argument's going to be able to get that premise 1 to work and its strongest interpretation, it destroys all possibility of knowledge. In a weaker interpretation, I mean, you might be able to turn this into an argument that God can't have credences of one, although I'm highly skeptical of that, and that's assuming that God even has credences. So I think that to make this argument work, you need another version of premise one. But I don't know what that would look like. Maybe another non-Bayesian analysis of certainty? I don't know. But I'm open to continuing to investigate this argument, because the more I think about it, the more it keeps bringing up interesting topics. Anyways, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and support me on Patreon if you enjoy this content.